So you got me a boat again? Oh, a private boat. It's waiting for me in the lagoon? Okay, cool. But, but can I come home soon? Y yeah, we'll probably do a bunch of ghost movies or maybe some famous sci-fi horror ones when I get back. Oh, oh we're doing a shark sci-fi one today? Oh, neato. No, no, I doubt any viewers have noticed the last couple have all been ocean themed. Y yeah, yeah, uh, um, producers? The boat you got me. It wouldn't happen to be called the normal boat, would it? No, no, it's fine. I'll call you later. The things I do for spooky movies. Science fiction. It's one of those things that can easily hold hands with another genre. Take some swords, knights, esoteric orders, and a little magic, and you got something that resembles King Arthur in Camelot, but with a sprinkle of science fiction. And to the traditional swords and sorcery, we add the droids, the blasters, and the spaceships. Give it a good stir, and voila! You g hey, wait! Star Wars still isn't science fiction. B b but I thought it was a space opera. Pretty much only the metachlorians count as sci-fi. Are you sure about that? Oh. That's science fantasy. Okay, so what is science fiction then? Many Google's letter. So, how I understand it, for something to be science fiction, science, in some shape or form, needs to be vital to the story. In Terminator, science is used to send a metal man back in time to kill an unborn leader of a future resistance. In Frankenstein, the doctor's creation is brought to life using medicine and science. Jurassic Park, scientists use science to scientifically mess around with dinosaur DNA and bring extinct animals back from non-existence using science. And then in Star Wars, well, they have spaceships and droids and laser weapons, but other than the midichlorians, why are you booing me? Other than the force bacteria, there is very little actual science involved in the Star Wars plot. It's all destiny and prophecy and yada yada yada. If I took all the science out of Planet of the Apes, how would you explain the story? Man goes to sleep while driving, wakes up in primate exhibit. You see what I'm saying? Deep Blue Sea, though, definitely has an amount of science in it. Dumb science, like... They recognize that gun. But science nonetheless. Caution. Science has shown that spoilers will be happening in this review. So if that bothers you, simply stick your fingers in your ears and go, la 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 la. Do not click away from this video for your own safety. Our story starts off with some young people boating at night. That is until they get a visit from an escaped shark. But thankfully for them, before anyone gets eaten, the shark gets captured by our leading man, Carter Blake, played by Thomas Jane. You know, the dad from The Mist. But that doesn't matter, as we cut to Lady Scientist. A, a, a Lady Scientist? What wondrous science fiction is this? Dr. Susan McAllister, played by Saffron Burroughs. We learn that she is working on a cure for Alzheimer's disease, with the help of shark brains? But her benefactor, Russell Franklin, played by Samuel Jackson, is getting antsy about their experiments. But the two compromise. Give me till Monday morning, 48 hours. I'll give you results that'll skyrocket your stock price or I'll help you pack the lab myself. And make their way over to the Oceanic Research Facility to get some results in a toned-down Jurassic Park arrival kind of way. Looks like Alcatraz floats. There it is.
Here we meet the rest of the science crew, starting with a spunky marine biologist by the name of Jan, played by Jacqueline McKenzie. We also learn that there are in fact three scientifically altered sharks at the facility that scientists are messing around with. These three are the test sharks, two first generation and one second generation female. And that a storm is heading their way. Hey Ben, I'm picking up a nasty little bitch of a squall about 30 miles out. <laughs> Is it like a rule that most ocean movies need storms or something? Oh, followed, of course, by our introduction to the brilliant Dr. Jim Whitlock. He's pissing into the wind. How brilliant can he be? Played by Stellan Skarsgård. And the trustworthy Tom Scoggins. Because I'm trustworthy. Played by Michael Rapport. But it seems like our hero Carter needs to let the audience know about the fences around the area. Hey, how high are these fences off the water? which we get given in a dumb science way. Eight feet, give or take a centimeter? Mixing imperial and metric? Don't you mean 2.4 meters, give or take a centimeter? Or was it eight feet, give or take 0.4 of an inch? Anyway, Russell gets a brief overview of what his money bought these scientists. Before we learn that shenanigans are afoot regarding all these shark tests that they are up to, we're skipping three rounds of preliminary trials. No choice. Whilst elsewhere, we learn of Carter's colorful past. Well, a man's always got a file, what to say? Two years, Leavenworth, smuggling. But surely there is a galley somewhere in this aquatic hellscape. So meet Chef Preacher, played by LL Cool J, who is probably best known for being LL Cool J. So, Preacher feeds the people, and the people feed the sharks, uh, other sharks? Oh, okay. Later, during some birthday festivities, we learn of the rationale behind why sharks are being used for their experimentation. And sharks never get cancer or go blind or show any loss of brain activity as they age. Plus, Carter's concerns regarding the sharks. They're hunting in packs, like wild dogs. But as the storm starts raging above water, the experiment begins, with Carter doing his shark wrangling thing. Tell me I didn't see that. They recognize that gun. No, 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 no. Not only do they recognize guns, but apparently also cameras. Because of course they would. But the experiments proceed as the scientists harvest some of that sweet sharky brain proteins. That seems is just what they need for a successful test. But of course, things go wrong as the brilliant Dr. Jim gets his arm bitten off by the super smart shark. That quickly gets released back into the water before Carter can pull a quint move on it. So the gang call in an emergency helicopter in order to evacuate Dr. Jim. But with the storm raging on, it becomes more than tricky. And alas, things go from bad to worse, as the winch holding up Jim fails, essentially creating a flying fishing rod that quickly crashes into the facility control tower. Sir. Sensors indicate. Smart sharks causing havoc throughout all of the underwater sections of the lab. But it doesn't end here for Jim, as the smarty sharks use his body as a projectile to smash the glass of the underwater labs, flooding the facility. Damn. Smart sharks. Elsewhere in the facility, Preacher detecting evil science has a quick powwow with the man upstairs. No need to get all carried away. Show me your vengeful side. I know your wrath, Lord. As he makes his way up and out of the facility, so you are highly religious, your name is Preacher, and you work with people playing God. A bit on the nose if you ask me. That is until a torrent of water joins him downstairs, separating him from his companion Burb. Back at the science gang, after a narrow escape, Moneybags Russell here starts asking all the questions that the audience must be having. Is that a goddamn shark broke through that door? It can do that? Bust through a steel door? Just what the hell did you do to those sharks? Jim and I use gene therapies to increase their brain mass. Larger brain means more protein. 
So, science gone amok. As a side effect, the sharks got smarter. Back to Preacher who is getting chased by a corridor shark into his own kitchen, gets his pet eaten and pulls a Spielberg by hiding in an oven. Let's just hope these sharks are dumber than raptors. Wait, 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 wait. Did, did that shark just turn on the gas by accident? Or was it on purpose? Regardless, Preacher, filled with the will to survive, escapes the oven, pulls a lighter from his waterlogged pocket that miraculously works, and explodes his would-be attacker. Back to science, gang. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of jumping back and forth here for a while. Science Gang decides on the far smarter choice of using the maintenance ladder, but not before some ominous backstory of Russell. Now we took an oath that I'm breaking now. Swore that we say it was the snow who killed the other two. You know, but these inspirational speeches, they mean nothing to Mother Nature, as Russell quickly gets disposed of by the smart shark. Thus, the gang decide it is time to skedaddle topside. But the pressure of the lab is unstable, causing more flooding for our would-be escapees. And you know what more flooding means in this movie? Shark cam activated. Seeking prey. The future is shark motherfuckers. They make their way further up the shaft, water and sharks on their heels with the facility crumbling around them leading to Jan falling into the water, where she quickly gets turned into a water world show with a bloody conclusion. But hey, now it seems there is space for Preacher to join your adventuring party. Always good to have a cleric on board. Time passes, people bond, more dumb science is spouted. Einstein's theory of relativity. Grab hold of a hot pan, a second can seem like an hour. Put your hands on a hot woman, an hour can seem like a second. More relative. And the group start their plan of escape by draining areas of the flooded lab. But not before Dr. Jim's corpse surprises Carter. Uh-huh. What movie? I'm not going to be scared. It's like that scene in Jaws. Very Spielbergian. But thankfully, our two divers here find the switches they need. Too bad that right afterwards, Scoggins gets eaten. Uh, brutally so. followed by Carter's escape. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the facility, Dr. Susan attempts to recover what she can of her shark brain research, but gets a visit from her former patient that tries to eat her. But thankfully, she has a plan on getting out of this, involving derobing and electrocuting the shark. Which also leads to her research getting destroyed. Daddy Normal, did the lady doctor take her clothes off for a dumb reason? <laughs> well, you see, Beyond Junior, it was for a very cool, very grown-up science reason. But Daddy, surely a wetsuit won't protect- uh, Hush, hush, hush. It's science. Uh, okay. Stupid kids. The three reconvene, getting ready to make a break for the water surface, but not before Preacher imbues them all with holy blessings. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. They miraculously reach the surface, but are immediately back in peril as Preacher gets momentarily dragged off by a shark. before it gets a crucifix to the eye. Funny how sometimes the sharks instantly kill someone, and other times they give them a fighting chance. I mean, I'm just saying. Now, safely above water, Carter realizes that they were merely pawns in the shark's deeper ploy. They've been hurting us. 
pushing us where they want, using us to flood the facility. So, so, so let me get this straight. These sharks know what cameras are, know what guns are, know the corridors of this facility, and know flooding areas will get them where they need to be. Smart sharks. Thus, they decide they must kill the remaining beastie, using a harpoon and some explosives. Explosives? Hmm. Must be a completely unique idea. You screw around with these tanks and they're gonna blow up! But of course, things can't go smoothly, so Dr. Susan decides to use herself as bait. For some reason. She may be the smartest animal in the world, but she's still just an animal. Come to Mama. Which goes, uh... Badly. Yeah. You have no one to blame but yourself for this. Didn't even consider just dripping the blood into the water. You had to go and be all, look at me, I'm taking responsibility for my scientific actions against God. <laughs> Call yourself a mad scientist? And for the love of God, why are you going after her, Carter? What the hell do you think you can do to fix the situation? But thankfully, Preacher lands a double critical hit, harpooning both the shark and Carter <laughs> before blowing them up in a strangely familiar way. Huh. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. With the shark destroyed and Carter alive, because of some fortuitous fencing, our two survivors share some light-hearted humor. Bring me some sushi! As our movie ends with rescue coming in. Take me back to the ghetto. Amen. Well, that wraps up the plot. Now let's get the technical stuff out of the way. 1999's Deep Blue Sea was directed by Rennie Harlan. You know, that guy that directed Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4. You know, the one where the girl turns into a bug. Plus, he directed 2004's Mindhunters, which was essentially Saw, but loads of cops to mangle. And I'd rather not talk about Exorcist the beginning. He's gone. The movie was written by Duncan Kennedy and Donna and Wayne Powers. Aww, husband and wife writer. Oh. oh. And Deep Blue Sea is just one of many in a slew of modern-ish creature features of my youth. Honestly, it felt like there was a point in time where you couldn't swing a stick without hitting a giant snake or a giant spider or a crocodile or a whatever. And as far as writing goes, well, it isn't that it's bad. It, it isn't that it's clever, don't get me wrong. It's just that I think it was meant to be dumb. Would you zip me up, please? I mean, let me start off by saying I have no nostalgia for Deep Blue Sea. I distinctly remember my fellow younglings going ape over it in school. And as I've mentioned in the past, Jaws was one of my first spooky movies. So I went in with a high watermark of what I expected from a shark movie. And when I saw it around age 11 or 12, all I could think was, God, this is dumb. What a ripoff. Jaws did this better. Wh why don't you guys want to talk to me? Why don't, you, why don't you want to be my friend? And the amount of times I imagined the director and the writers just went, Hey, 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 let's do it like Spielberg. But you know... Not as good. The arrival, the jump scares, Carter popping out of the water is like that one bit in Poltergeist. Which I know isn't Spielberg, but it is Spielberg, but it's not Spielberg, but we all know it's Spielberg. But it isn't Spielberg. That's very disrespectful towards Toby Hooper. But now, yeah, I still think Jaws is the better movie. But now that I am older and far wiser than a dumb 12-year-old, I have come to appreciate the movie for... 
other reasons. No, not those. I love it now because it's a dumb, popcorn-chomping, shark sci-fi flick. A very simple story of scientists playing God, which the movie is quite ham-fisted about. I have a feeling the target audience were maybe a bunch of 11 and 12 year olds who might lack understanding of subtlety. But I mean, sci-fi has a history of going against nature. But Professor, you know those science things we've been doing to the test subjects? Yes, yes. Well, our actions have come back to haunt us, sir. My god, what has science done? And of course, Deep Blue Sea is just... Professor, you know those science things we've been doing to the sharks? Well, our actions have come back to haunt us. My god, what does science continue to do? And that's just what this is. An hour and 38 minutes of cheesy dialogue, dumb science, and people getting eaten. I mean, no one goes around complaining about how bad the writing of Friday the 13th is. And I f love Friday the 13th, don't you get me wrong. But these sharks are essentially just mindless serial killers going about their serial killing business. Sure, some of the effects have aged poorly, and most of the acting is hammy. But I don't think people would ever claim that this was a masterpiece. But now, the big question is, is it worth, you the viewers, time? Yes, especially with friends. Make a few if you must. Gather round, grab sushi pizza, and cast your viewing orbs upon the utter schlock that is the deep blue sea. You won't have an enlightening time, but you'll definitely have a time, that's for sure. So give it a watch, give it a go, give it a gander, and maybe you'll... What? Hi there, we're a bunch of mysterious babes out on a mysterious cruise far away from any help or witnesses. Care to join us? Hmm, well, you do seem trustworthy enough. Yeah, totally. We're not a bunch of murderous ghost babes or anything like that. <laughs> you had me at murderous ghost babes. Say, have any of you ladies ever seen Deep Blue Sea?